on the last two forums, I should say that Linda has sat at the podium and commented on the presentation. And they've been very rich, and I've put both of them, and she's going to do it again on June 11th when we have our next forum. Uh, I've put all of her commentaries on the website, so they're there for people to see. What the, the, uh, the Historical Society of Elizabeth, uh, you, you talk about the 20th century. I mean, we've moved so far in the 20th century. We went from a, mm -hmm. a workforce for the first 40 years, which was really white men. There was nobody else in the workforce, mm -hmm. and then it naturally changed in the next 50 years um, with immigrants, African Americans, and women entering the workforce. So. Is it more than just a workforce history of Elizabeth, or is oh, it? Oh yeah, it is. But I would I would say the the women were working there all the time; they just weren't being paid for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, it is more than that. It's um, we're really trying to reconstruct the social and cultural fabric of the city and to pay attention to the basic patterns that condition government policies. And so it's imperative that the mayor read the website and pass the quiz. Uh, on, on what the, uh, the history of this, uh, of this society is and where the policies today, especially the innovative ones, actually fit and what kind. History will also sort of give you a sense of what the probabilities of success are. What's been interesting to me is that we always, or at least I always, thought of Elizabeth as these ethnic conclaves. To an extent they yes, were. Uh, there was Peterstown, there was C Curry Head. Um, but what we have found, looking through census records and drawing out from those oral histories, is that Elizabeth has always been quite a diverse city, and the neighborhoods within it have been diverse as well. Um, there was Peterstown, thought to be Italian, but there were African Americans living there, there were Jews living there, there were Poles living there. And we found that true for all of the, all of the areas of the city that we've done that we've done studies Even Cherry on. Head, which has the reputation of being an Irish neighborhood, is only about 15% Irish. It's a really a, a very small factor. And in the neighborhood where Linda grew up, which is the neighborhood we're targeting for the forum that's coming up, um, there is an Irish cluster in 1920 of about 23, 24%. That's the biggest. The rest of them are all a series of very small enclaves in which no one ethnic or racial group dominates. It's interesting you said it because when I review, and actually my mm -hmm. history would go back with the po politics. Mm -hmm. If you look at the names of the people on city council, sure. and the mayor yeah, from 1900 right. to 1940, right. they're all Irish. That's right. In fact, there might have been one or two Jewish and, folks, but and, all and, Irish. And the pastors and the nuns who staffed uh, St. Elizabeth. All Irish. And the policemen and many mm -hmm. of the firemen. This is why some of these sectors get a sense of being an Irish place, is because the authority figures were Irish. But if you do the demography, it's not, it's not an Irish concentration. That's interesting to learn. Yeah. The, uh, the Elizabeth Forum and the central theme, uh, the research that's been done, has, have you, Linda, as somebody who grew up here, have you been uh, shocked or altered by the research of Dr. Manley? Have you, do you think it's different than your perception, I should say? Well, I, just like everyone else, thought of Curry Head as an Irish neighborhood. Right. So I just, you know, yeah. although thinking back on it, and I've often said this, Paul has heard me say, um, mm -hmm. what we probably had in common is that we were a lower working class neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Thought to be Irish, but I ate neck bones with uh, sauerkraut from the Kelkers who were German. Uh, and tomato gravy with the Fiellas who were across the street, um, with dumplings uh, from the Novikis who were Polish. And so even what I grew up thinking or believing to be true, really, when I took time to sat, sit back and actually think of my neighbors, realized that it, it was not true at all. That That's we, an interesting yeah. comment because, you know, the perception of a lot of people is going to be changed by this Elizabeth yes, Forum, it will. and you know, and your oral histories, and yeah. that was a great one because the names you mentioned, I knew, I used to take you know, Mrs. Nowicki in the last years of her life to the polls to vote. See, see you know. <laughs> of course, I should add we had them in neck bones and black eyed peas in my house. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's there's an extension of this, and um, the extension of it is the realization that we were a multiracial, multicultural community, and we got along. We really did get along. We loved each other as neighbors. They were focusing we helped each on other. the basic mm -hmm. routines of survival, mm -hmm. uh, work opportunities. Um, food patterns retained right. a kind mm -hmm. of traditional distinctiveness, mm -hmm. but it didn't intrude upon these, other, uh, on these other interrelations that often divide neighbors. 
Now, oral history is a unique way to do things. Can you give us some specific examples of what's going to be unveiled on June 11th? Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, one of the things that we think we've discovered is the importance of the dominant occupation in the neighborhood we've, we've looked at. And the same would hold for a neighborhood that we looked at last year. The dominance of skilled laborers, over 50% in 1910, 20, and 30. The presence of machinists, that's one of the most common, um, is, is so important because it provides a resource for many different factories making very different kinds of products to come here because they know the workforce is here to make the tools and the machines. And I'm not the first one to say this, a very important historian, Herbert Gutman, made this point about Patterson, but it applies to, to Elizabeth as well. The resource is the skilled labor. That's why the diversity of factories. Uh, and it's true, actually, of, of Newark as well. And we think that the presence of machinists, not only did it become a big attract attraction for factory workers, it was a big attraction for unions. And in fact, when they organized for uh, a living wage, it meant that machinists could actually have families and decent living. Mm -hmm. um, something for all of the advancement of, say, Jersey Gardens, it's, it's not the same. It doesn't fit the same kind of economic slot that, say, Durant Motors did. Yeah, Linda, the historical nature, you've been dealing with history now for a long time, mm -hmm. and oral histories have to even be new for you, I mean, even though you've been involved in historical perspective. How do you think oral histories that Dr. Manley is compiling will affect the future, not only of Elizabeth, but people that are actually involved in historical societies? Well, I think the way we're training uh, upcoming historians, it's, mm -hmm. it's their learning. Their research methods are totally different than the research methods that I used while in undergraduate and graduate school. Their, um, just their sensitivity to public history uh, from this bottom-up approach that Paul mentioned at the outside of this is a very different way of mastering the discipline uh, than I was taught. I'll admit that I did my first uh, history project, uh, historical project on Elizabeth while an undergrad. Uh, I was an American Studies major and we had to do something on our hometown. Mm. And I ch selected Singer Sewing Machine and that mm. was my first um, real assignment on doing some serious research about Elizabeth. But I started from the position of the political machines of the mayors and the city council people. I did not start from the people who actually lived in the neighborhoods. If I were going to do a history now, that's mm -hmm. the way I would do it. So um, our historians are, are going to be trained differently. Therefore, the kind of information that they're going to um, present will be reflective of the population of the city itself, not just those rulers who were in charge. And you said yourself, if you look at the roles of police commissioners, firemen, et cetera, you will see that they were Irish. Well, these new historians will say that the Irish were only a certain percentage of, if you, if you looked at it that way, you'd think nothing but Irishmen lived in Elizabeth. Well, you, you, and we you know, you know that that's, not, that's true. not true. I know that. Yeah. And, and, but you look at the people that led the city almost for 30, 35 years. They were clearly one ethnic group. And uh, it's much more diverse now than it was. Uh, another itself. question would be, right? How did the Irish manage to maintain control mm -hmm. of all those institutions mm -hmm. for so long? I think you gave us the answer. They got all the jobs at Singer, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what, what oral history also does is makes you pay attention to the extracurricular and non-occupational activities of mm -hmm. citizens, especially volunteer organizations that they create themselves and in which they invest themselves very substantively to the point where in some cases they will they will simply say this you know we created our own neighborhood and they did and so I asked you know what was the contribution of your councilmen and mayors uh, sometimes we get effusive endorsements of say Mayor Bowich and his work in creating the Stephen Sampson Center um, but but in other cases they say we didn't have anything to do with them and, and they didn't know who we were either it was like they're two cities or two layers in the same city with not much interaction. And we're very interested in that issue, what, what that interaction is. 